Hi, I'm Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist from PsychScene. Welcome to another episode of Hub Bites. Today I'll be taking you through the neurobiology of post-traumatic stress disorder and linking it to some key clinical principles in the management of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's important that none of what I describe in the video is to be construed as medical advice. And if you're a non-medical professional, please discuss any of this with your doctor. When the brain is exposed to stress, now this may be either a life-threatening event in the, similar to um, what happens in post-traumatic stress disorder, or it could be due to significant childhood traumatic events. Essentially, when the brain is exposed to stress, it releases corticotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which then goes and acts on the pituitary gland and signals it to release ACTH. ACTH then goes and acts on the adrenal gland, telling the adrenal gland to release cortisol. Cortisol is considered to be the stress hormone. Now, the release of cortisol and further signaling to release cortisol exists in a negative feedback loop. What I mean by that is that when there's increased secretion of cortisol, it basically tells the hypothalamus to stop releasing any further CRH, which therefore results in a decrease in ACTH and therefore decrease in cortisol. So that's the negative feedback loop. But in post-traumatic stress disorder, this particular process is dysfunctional. Essentially what happens is corticotropin releasing hormone is still released due to the exposure to the stressful uh, environment. But this, the receptors here in the pituitary are sensitized. What that means is they do not respond to signals from the corticotropin releasing hormone. Therefore, there is decrease in the ACTH. And because there's a decrease in ACTH, there is also a decrease in cortisol. Now this would seem very counterintuitive, decreased cortisol in post-traumatic stress disorder, but this has significant clinical impl implications. We know that cortisol is anti-inflammatory and you can see that because of decreased cortisol, what can happen is from a clinical perspective, it induces an inflammatory state and individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder can have significant inflammatory disorders and cardiovascular diseases that might be comorbid. So it's important for clinicians to look at that. The other important aspect that the cortisol dysfunction tends to do is the following. We know that trauma results in increase in noradrenaline, which is essentially the, the neurotransmitter responsible for the fight and flight. So there's increase in noradrenaline. The function of noradrenaline is to result in the consolidation of memory. So for example, when we're giving exams, a certain amount of stress is beneficial because it allows us to remember things and the memories get consolidated. So there's increased consolidation of memories with noradrenaline. Now, the issue in post-traumatic stress disorder is that if there is increased noradrenaline, it can result in an increased consolidation of the traumatic memories because they've been exposed to a significant amount of trauma and therefore there is an increased consolidation of traumatic memories. Now what that results, is, results in is increased fear conditioning. What that means is even non-aversive stimuli could get tagged on to traumatic memories resulting in increased fear conditioning. So for example, an individual may go out shopping, which is a non-aversive stimulus, but they might hear a loud noise. That particular environment then gets tagged on to a traumatic trigger, and those events can later on act as traumatic tr triggers. So what that can do is over time, people can become, people with post-traumatic stress disorder can become more and more avoidant of a range of tasks because non-aversive stimuli start becoming traumatic triggers. So it's a very, very important point to remember clinically. Now what this increased fear conditioning does is it results in difficulty in achieving fear extinction, habituation and extinction, which are important aspects in reducing hyperarousal and important aspects in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And essentially, noradrenaline, the way the body would try to reduce noradrenaline in normal circumstances is by increasing cortisol. So that's where this comes in. 
but we know that in post-traumatic stress disorder we saw earlier that there is decreased cortisol so it results in unopposed noradrenaline release and therefore exacerbates this whole process making it more and more likely for the individual to have enhanced consolidation of the traumatic memories increase in fear conditioning and difficulty achieving fear extinction therefore from a clinical perspective it is very very important that in the initial stages of management that it, we reduce this noradrenaline or the hyperarousal that uh, comes with the increased noradrenaline and from a clinical perspective this can be done by using alpha 2 agonists alpha 2 agonists the ones that are commonly used in post-traumatic stress disorder are prazosin and clonidine so i use both in clinical practice clonidine can be started at 50 micrograms gradually increasing to about 200 micrograms given at night time the main side effect to keep an eye out for is a drop in blood pressure it can result in postural hypotension so can prazosin prazosin can drop blood pressure and prazosin can be started off at one milligram initially at night time but because of a short half-life can be given three times a day and it can be very effective in reducing hyperarousal thus allowing the process of psychological treatment to then put, be put in place and it's more effective because the individual then is able to address many of these issues that are required as part of the psychological treatment so essentially there are two phenotypes and they're known as emotional undermodulation and emotional overmodulation and this is basically the battle that occurs between the frontal lobe and the temporal limbic system when there is a decreased prefrontal inhibition of the temporal limbic system you essentially get emotional undermodulation and emotional undermodulation results in essentially excess activity from the temporal limbic system resulting in agitation hyperarousal features of agitation as a whole could be mixed features could be traumatic triggers flashbacks nightmares hyperarousal hypervigilance which are part of post-traumatic stress disorder whilst the other phenotype is what we call emotional overmodulation. Now this is an excessive prefrontal inhibition of the temporal limbic system. And emotional overmodulation means that the emotional and the reward area is blunted or is numb. And this results in emotional numbing. It can result also in depersonalization and derealization reactions. So to summarize, Within post-traumatic stress disorder, we have decreased cortisol as opposed to the normal stress reaction where we would have increased cortisol. We also have excessive noradrenergic activity. And because of decreased cortisol, cortisol cannot reduce this excessive noradrenergic activity. Therefore, there is enhanced consolidation of traumatic memories, which results in increased fear conditioning and difficulty achieving habituation extinction. And therefore, it's important to consider medication interventions at times when the hyperarousal is significant and one can use clonidine or prazosin to achieve this aim and finally in post-traumatic stress disorder in the short term it's important to recognize that address hyperarousal and in the long term it allows the individual to engage in trauma-based psychotherapy much more effectively this is known as phase-oriented treatment in trauma-related disorders and as an evidence-based strategy. I hope that you found this hub bite useful. Take care and stay safe.